Hello team. Welcome. Here we go. Uh, we're going to have some lecture today. Let's just revisit this equation. I want to make sure everybody's up to snuff with this equation here. Um, so just to kind of reiterate the equation, you know, photosynthesis and cellular, ration, cellular respiration are complementary chemical reactions. We're going to be talking about both of them in great detail. This is one pathway for photosynthesis. There are others, um, but this is the main photosynthetic pathway of photosynthetic organisms. Uh, you'll notice we've balanced the equation by putting a six and a six and a six here, so the reactants and the products all equal one another. Uh, so, you know, you're going to see this again, and I just wanted to bring it to your attention. We will have a PowerPoint presentation today. And Let me just pull up my bio 120. Today we're going to talk about tissues, plant tissues. And if you look in the, uh, in, it's actually in the second module, which says plants. And you can see right here, there's plant tissues PowerPoint. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, after you watch the video, to go through and look at the PowerPoint on your own. There's also some required reading on plant cells and plant tissues. Okay. So we typically break up um, plant tissues into simple and complex. And it's really just more of a, of a convenience thing, uh, honestly. Um, I wouldn't ask you, for example, on the test, is it a simple tissue or a complex tissue? I don't think that that's warranted. But just for the sake of, of um, you know, of, of, of explanation, it's nice to do this. What is a tissue? Tissues are groups of cells which perform a specific function in the organism. And so if you think about animals, you know, you know lots of animal tissues, for example, muscle tissue or skin would be an example of a tissue, the epidermis. Plants also have an epidermis as a tissue type. So it turns out that although animals have many different kinds of tissues, plants are a little more simplistic in terms of the different types of tissues or cells that you see. Uh, remember, all plant cells have cell walls, so that's going to be, you know, another obvious difference. Uh, so if you look at simple tissues, we have uh, these three, parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma, and then uh, there should be an H here, actually. This is misspelled, sorry. Uh, and then under the sclerenchyma uh, category, we have fibers and sclerates. Now, the difference really between simple plant tissues and complex plant tissues is in a complex plant tissue, you have two or more tissue uh, cell types making up the tissue together. Uh, and so you might be wondering, well, why is sclerenchyma then considered a simple tissue? And it's really because fibers and sclerids don't exist together in the tissue, either their fibers or their sclerids. And this will, this should make more sense um, a little bit later. So what about parenchyma? Well, parenchyma is probably the most common type of living cell in plants. It's found in all different parts of plants. It's found in uh, leaves, stems, roots, flowers, fruits, you name it, it's, it's everywhere. And one of the things that's characteristic about uh, parenchyma in terms of its morphology and being able to recognize it under a microscope is the cell walls are very thin and there's a large lumen or space in the middle. And so um, if you think about the shape of these cells, you might say they're round, but they're really not round. If you, if you think about it, think about a bubble floating through the air. It's roughly spherical. Uh, 
but what if you put some soap and some water and blew bubbles in it in a jar, the bubbles then are no longer round. They, they have sides where they push against each other. And it's very similar uh, to the sclerenchyma tissue. As these cells grow, they start out kind of roundish or spherical, but then where they bump into each other, it makes a flat edge. And that's what you're seeing here. The primary function of parenchyma is the storage of food and water. And we're going to you know, think about uh, what's food for a plant? Well, sugar, obviously, glucose is the photosynthate, and then plants store their excess sugar as starch, okay? And then water as well. We know that plants are mostly made of water, right? And so these parenchyma cells are for the storage of food and water. To give you an example, when you eat an apple, when you take a bite of an apple, most of the cells that you're eating that have the sugar and the water in them are uh, parenchyma cells. Okay, so then we get to cholenchyma. Cholenchyma is uh, characterized morphologically by having these irregular thickenings in the cell walls. And so you can see uh, there are places where uh, the cell walls are much thicker than they were in the cholenchyma. And the function of, of the, or in the parenchyma rather, the function of the cholenchyma is flexible support. Now let's think for a second about plants. Uh, think about trees and the wind, right? They're not rigid. And one of the things about plants is, is that they're very flexible and they need to be flexible. And they need to be flexible because otherwise uh, they would succumb to the environmental conditions like wind. So rather than being rigid and potentially snapping in the wind, what the plant does is it flexes in the wind. And we know that this is a good strategy uh, for the plant. Interestingly, this stuff called, uh, this tissue called cholenchyma is, is referred to as cholenchyma uh, because it contains collagen. Let me just take a little screen sketch here and then I can write on the, on the screen. Collagen is found in uh, these cells, and collagen is the same uh, the same protein which is found in animals. And the most notable place you would find collagen in animals is uh, in, in the region uh, underneath the skin, where the skin is attached to the underlying muscle. If you grab your skin on your forearm, go ahead and do that. Grab your skin on your forearm uh, and you release it, pull it and release it. What does it do? It snaps back, right? And that's because of these collagenous fibers. Uh, it's almost like the elastic band in your underwear. It stretches. Now, sadly for us, over time, this collagen wears out, doesn't it? It, um, you know, it, it quite literally wears out. And so that's why we start to sag. And humans are pretty vain, right? A lot of us are. And so one of the things that we do is we might um, buy a collagen cream or do collagen injections. Now collagen is a very large protein molecule. So a collagen cream is probably not going to work. The, the, the collagen can't really get through all those skin cells and make its way down where, it's, where it belongs. You can certainly uh, inject collagen, and uh, you know, you've know you seen people that puff their lips up probably, uh, Angelina Jolie style. Uh, over time, the collagen, because it's not really in the cells, is reabsorbed, and so you would have to continue uh, doing this, um, this procedure, okay? Next, we have Sclerenchyma, and sclerenchyma is morphologically, you can see that the cell walls are very, very thick. And you can see there's not a lot of space or lumen in the cell wall. What you're looking at here is actually uh, probably a cross section through a stem. And you can see here's some epidermis, some epithelial tissue with its waxy covering. What about these cells? What would these be? We've already seen these. These would be parenchyma cells. Here we have these bundles of sclerenchyma. 
Uh, and specifically sclerenchyma is for rigid support. It's very strong. These are almost like rebars running up the length of a stem uh, that keep the, the that provide strength to the uh, to the plant stem, and they can be found in other places as well. Now, as we saw in the very first slide, there are two different kinds of sclerenchyma. One is called the fiber, or, or actually, I'm sorry, sclerids are the first ones. Uh, that we'll talk about. The sclerid is also known as a stone cell and they are very, very hard. And you can see this is a, a micrograph of some stone cells here. They're almost literally like little hard stones inside of the, of the plant. And anytime you have or encounter very hard substances in plants, they're probably made of sclerids. Most notably, you know, think about what's the hardest part of a plant you can think of. The pit of a droop or a, a, the pit of a stone fruit like a cherry or a peach or a walnut shell uh, or an olive shell. Think about how hard these are. You find out if you accidentally or inadvertently bite down on one, right? It hurts. It can break your tooth. It's very, very hard. We, when you measure the hardness of, for example, a peach pit, uh, it's actually harder than steel, if you can believe that. It's not as strong as steel because it doesn't have the tensile strength, but it is very, very hard. And so, uh, you know, the obvious function in this case is the protection of the underlying seed, uh, which is inside of the pit. So um, this, if I had to guess, I would say that this micrograph probably is a micrograph of some pear pulp. So if you think about a pear, the fruit, its texture is a bit gritty, and it's gritty because there are these aggregates of stone cells right there in the flesh that you eat. Fibers are the other kind of sclerenchyma, and fibers end up being incredibly important to humans. Uh, why is that? Well, because we extract them from plants and we make things out of them. Uh, most notably, what we make out of, uh, of plant fibers are textiles, uh, cloth, paper, rope, right? And so these uh, plant fibers end up being extremely important. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about plant fibers. We're going to actually talk quite a bit more about them because they're so important. And so I'm going to actually um, talk, we're going to actually talk a little bit about uh, paper and the paper making process. Uh, we know that these fibers have been used. The oldest known textiles are 5,000 years old. Uh, hemp cloth was, was discovered uh, in Persia uh, that was 5,000 years old. So we know that humans for at least 5,000 years have been weaving plant fibers into cloth. Uh, same with paper. Paper is a very old uh, process. I want to talk a little bit about making paper and the paper making process now. And um, typically, at least in North America, we make paper from trees. All right. And so it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference what kind of trees. Uh, and so one of the things that they do is they find a, a place where there's trees and they just cut all the trees down and then they chip them up, right? And then trees being perennial plants are full of a substance called lignin. And so I'm gonna say that the chips are lignified. Lignin is actually what makes wood hard. Um, annual plants don't have very much lignin in them. They typically have just a little bit. But each year that a plant grows, its cell wall lays down more of this chemical called lignin, L-I-G-N-I-N. And the thing about lignin is it's brown. It's a dark color. And so what they do then is they take these wood chips, they separate the fibers. So then we have lignified fibers. 
And then there's this last process called delignification. And this typically involves using chlorine. So they take the lignified fibers, which are brown, they soak them in chlorine, and then they get white fibers. And then those white fibers can be used to make uh, paper that's white. Okay, well, there's a fundamental problem with this paper making process. And the fundamental problem is that when you mix lignin and chlorine together, you get this stuff called dioxin. And dioxin is highly toxic to animals. And particularly in mammals, it tends to bioaccumulate, meaning that, you know, let's say you're eating fish out of the river uh, and that dioxin is bioaccumulated in the fish and then it will further bioaccumulate in you. And so the concentrations get greater and greater. Unfortunately, seven to 10 PPBs of dioxin is considered mutagen and a carcinogen. A mutagen is a substance which causes the DNA to mutate and a carcinogen, that's probably an I there, sorry. I'm not writing very well. Um, carcinogen is a substance which can cause cancer. PPBs are parts per billion. And so what this says is that dioxin is an extremely toxic substance. Seven to 10 molecules per billion molecules of water is considered mutagenic and carcinogenic. And so what have we done with this dioxin in the past? Well, believe it or not, we've dumped it in the river. <laughs> uh, if you look at the mill in Canton, uh, for years and years, the mill was uh, given a variance which allowed them to dump the dioxin into the Pigeon River. Consequently, uh, Hartford, Tennessee, which is downstream, became known as Widowville because so many people got cancer and died, particularly men who were working in the river and uh, perhaps eating more of the fish out of the river. So, you know, we there's a cost for dealing with uh, this paper making process out of trees. And so what we might want to talk a little bit about is what are some alternatives or if there are any, what can we do to prevent this issue? Uh, recycling is obviously important, right? If we can eliminate the waste stream, um, then that's good. There are some issues with recycling. One of the issues is the fibers, every time you recycle a piece of paper, they have to wet the paper again and chop it up. And when they chop it up, the fibers get shorter and shorter and shorter. And so what that means is although recycling of paper is great, uh, you're still having to add a certain amount of, um, of virgin fiber usually in order to give the paper enough strength to hold together. Okay. What about re-education? Okay. Have you ever wondered why milk comes in a carton that's bleached white? Is there any reason why the milk carton can't be brown? Um, there's no reason at all. Same with ice cream or any other food, food container. Uh, there, was, there was a large um, dairy called Horizon Dairy. It's an organic dairy and they were catching a lot of flack from environmental groups because they were putting their organic milk in these, you know, dioxin laden bleached white containers. And they said, well, okay, well, we'll do a pilot study and we'll see, you know, what effect it has if we put the milk in a brown container. Well, guess what? Their sales went down. People are, are sort of brainwashed, if you will, into thinking that the white milk goes in a white container or the ice cream. And so, you know, re-educating people uh, to the reality that, you know, you don't necessarily have to um, have to have a, a white container for something like that. Now, obviously, if, you're, if it's paper, it's a little bit different because you want to be able to see the writing on the paper. So there is re-education and just really thinking about it. What about alternative fibers? 
Well, uh, what are some alternative fibers? Hemp is at, kind of at the top of the list these days, right? Hemp is big now. It's finally legal to grow hemp in North Carolina and throughout most of the United States. But for a long time, it was banned because it is, in fact, cannabis sativa, which is the same species as, um, as marijuana. Now, interestingly, hemp has about a point oh five to 0.5% THC content, meaning uh, if you smoke a joint of hemp, it's not going to get you high. There's not the psychoactive chemicals in it. Okay, so hemp is a big one. You know, we we're, we'll spend a second talking about hemp and kind of what happened to it. Um, there are some other ones. There's a plant called canaf, uh, which is in the hibiscus family. Uh, it's related to okra. Uh, and then ag waste, which is one that I'm a big proponent of. Uh, by ag waste, we're talking about the stubble of usually grain, like wheat, rye, barley. So if you think about the wheat belt uh, in, say, Kansas or Missouri, where they're growing huge amounts of wheat, they typically harvest the wheat heads, and then they're left with the stubble, the rest of the plant. It turns out that all of these plants are annual plants, meaning they only live for one year. And the good thing about using annual plants for paper is they don't have very much lignin. And because of that, you don't really have to bleach them. You can take hemp and you can make paper out of the fibers without bleaching them. And you will have a nice sort of light green colored um, paper. So it's good. Um, same with ag waste. The big problem with ag waste and with lots of these other uh, alternative fibers is we have, for the last you know 150 years, located our paper mills where the trees were, which is usually in the southeast or the or the west. Uh, whereas the places where we could be growing large amounts of hemp and canaf and using the ag waste is in the Midwest, in the middle of the country. And so it's not really very cost effective to move the paper mill. And so that's sort of what we're faced with. It's not cost effective to move the paper mill and it's not cost effective to move the ag waste to the paper mill halfway across the, the country. And so, you know, we, we're, we're facing uh, these sort of issues. But I suspect, uh, particularly with hemp, you'll start to see a good deal more um, paper being made from it in this country. Um, as well as fuel, biomass fuel, okay? So uh, there's the scoop. Um, there's actually a PowerPoint in, in the uh, Moodle um, I think it's in here, maybe not. I thought I had a PowerPoint about hemp. It may not have carried over. It doesn't look like it carried. Oh, there it is, actually, a history of hemp. So we can, oops, what have I done? We can spend, um, oh my goodness, my computer's going nuts, y'all. Sorry about that. Uh, we can spend a second, uh, a little more than a second, uh, looking at this, looking at this PowerPoint. Um, because you may wonder, with hemp being such an important plant throughout history, um, what happened to it? In other words, you know, what, why did it become illegal? Well, a little bit about the history of hemp. Believe it or not, there is a word that is one of the first known root words in any language, which would have been Sumerian. Sumerian or Sumerian is, one of the, is the, basically the first known language on earth. And the word is kanaba. Kanaba referred to the hemp plant. That's how important hemp was back then. It was literally one of the first words ever created to name something. It was also the first known textile found in the Middle East in dating, I, I said, I said 5,000, it's actually, I was incorrect earlier, it's actually about 10,000 YBP is years before present, okay? 
Uh, so, you know, the first known piece of cloth that we ever found was made of hemp. The word canvas is the Dutch word for cannabis because all canvas was made from hemp uh, and it was used to make sails. And so think about the relevance of the sails that were made from cannabis, right? That's how people got around on boats. Uh, you've probably heard the first draft of the Declaration of Independence was written on, um, on hemp paper. Okay, so there's all these things. Check this out. Henry Ford's, Henry Ford's first car was made of hemp and it ran on hemp oil. It was, this is, the, the, the first Model T Ford was actually made of hemp, uh, parts of it at least. This back panel was made completely of pressed hemp. Uh, hemp is very resinous and you can compress it and it would stick together and then he just would form these these back panels and then paint them. What you're seeing Henry Ford doing here, he's got a crowbar and he's bashing on the back panel to show how strong the hemp is uh, in his in his rear uh, trunk panel. And then there was no diesel back then. Uh, these These cars were made to run on hemp oil. Diesel came later. What happened to hemp? Well, there was this guy, boo, William Randolph Hearst. Uh, he was a timber baron, uh, among other things. Uh, back in the 1920s, uh, William Randolph Hearst, you, you may be familiar or have heard of Patty Hearst. She was uh, William Randolph Hearst's granddaughter. Uh, Hearst was a Timber Baron, as well as a media mogul. He owned all of the newspapers. And uh, he had a vested interest in keeping hemp down, primarily because he was making a lot of money off of his timber, which was being made into paper. In the 1920s, someone invented a machine which could separate the bast fibers from the hemp and very efficiently. And so when this occurred, uh, Hearst realized that there needed to be some sort of restrictions on this, or he was going to lose a great deal of money. Ooh, Lamont DuPont, owner of DuPont. Uh, his company was the industrial arm of the Third Reich. Uh, and I don't know if you knew this, but DuPont manufactured the Zycon B gas uh, for the Nazi death chambers. So not a great history there. Uh, in the 1930s, DuPont filed for a patent for a substance that was the first known synthetic fiber, which we call nylon. And when they started looking at their bottom line, they realized, well, um, we're going to make a lot of money off this synthetic fiber. The only thing holding it back is that the hemp fibers are so good to make rope and canvas and whatnot out of. And so they had a vested, vested interest in holding the hemp back as well. And then there was this guy, Andrew Mellon. He was the Secretary of State. He was a railroad man who was making a lot of money transporting wood chips for the Hearsts. And um, he had the ear of the Congress and convinced them to pass the marijuana tax law, which essentially made um, all forms of hemp illegal. Uh, and then they also hired this guy, Harry Anslinger, to be the first head of the DEA. So there was this sort of conspiracy that occurred to keep the hemp in all forms down. Um, but this guy, Harry Anslinger, he was a horrible, extreme racist and also a conspirator in the whole thing. Uh, here's one of his quotes, which was actually published. This was published in uh, one of... Randolph Hearst's newspapers, I think it was the San Francisco Chronicle. It says there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the US and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz and swing result from marijuana usage. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. And so you could just imagine, you know, the overt racism of this, of this man. Um, well, things have changed, right? Uh, and now who would have thought that, that medical and recreational marijuana would have taken the forefront before hemp? 
uh, but they have. And so now hemp is, uh, is legal in most states. In North Carolina, there's a pilot program and you can get a permit to grow it. And I'm sure you've seen some of it growing around now. It's quite common. And then, um, you know, many states have medicinal marijuana that's legal as well as, um, as well as recreational marijuana in some states like Colorado. None of the southern states have passed any sort of recreational uh, cannabis usage uh, laws or, or lack of laws, you might say. Uh, it'll be interesting to see which one of them falls first. And then we're almost done with the lecture, but um, you can see here a picture of, of a plant called canaf, and you can see it looks, it looks like a hibiscus. Canaf makes a beautiful yellow paper unbleached, and uh, it's very drought resistant and uh, very good biomass producer. So canaf is another uh, crop that could be potentially used and is being used uh, in some areas for fibers. Okay, lots of information for you there. Uh, and if we pop back into our plant tissues PowerPoint, we can look again here and let's just have a little bit of a, of a review. Parenchyma, food and water storage, very thin walled. Palenchyma, irregular thickenings in the cell wall. Uh, and flexible support, it contains collagen fibers. Scleranchyma, again, I'm sorry, there's, there should be an H there. Here, let me, this kind of thing drives me crazy. So let me correct it for you. There we go. <laughs> How's that? Okay. Scleranchyma contains lignin and it makes it very hard and strong. They have fibers which are used to make things like paper and cloth and sclerids which are stone cells which are very hard. Okay. All right. Moving along. we can have a little intro to the next section. Uh, and this next section is complex tissues. Um, what we mean by that is there's going to be more than one tissue type making up the tissue. So for example, we have xylem, which is made up of tracheids and vessels, and these will be found together in the same tissue. And we have phloem, which is made up of sieve cells and companion cells, which again will be found mixed together in the same tissue. Okay. We're going to come back. Uh, to talking about secretory tissues. That slide is kind of in the wrong place, sorry. Okay, let's talk a little bit about xylem. Xylem moves water up the plant. Some important things about xylem, one really important thing about it is it is dead at maturity. And when you think of xylem, think of the wood of a plant. Think about a tree. All of the wood is actually, all of the cells that make up the wood, they're, they're, they're not living. So if you think about the trunk of a tree, most of it is not living tissue. Xylem moves water up the plant. Xylem is a one-way street. Only water can move up. It does, there's no mechanism for water moving down. And the two types of cells which move the water are called tracheids and vessels. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those. Phloem moves the sugar 
which is dissolved in water. It's important to realize that when the sugar moves in a plant, it's, uh, it's not moving like a Dixie crystal sugar. It's moving dissolved in water, so sugar water. Sap is sugary water. Um, you'll note that phloem is living and it's a two-way street. So there's a mechanism for the sugar water to move up or down. So that, for example, in the spring, the sap, the sugary water is in the roots and it can move up the stem into the developing buds. In the summer, the spring and the summer, when the plant is actively growing, sugar is being made in the leaves and that sugar moves down the stem into the roots. So phloem is a two-way street, xylem is a one-way street, okay? Sorry. Let's talk about the difference between tracheids and vessels. It's very, it's very interesting. Um, tracheids are considered more primitive and vessels are considered more advanced. So for example, in a tracheid you have these cells like this. Remember, they're dead at maturity. They're really just hollow cell walls. But their end walls, sorry, it's hard, a little hard to draw on this thing, but their end walls are solid. They also have all these little pores in them, these little holes, including little openings between cells like this. And so what the water does, it's very kind of inefficient. The water moves its way up and it kind of fills the cell up and it runs into a dead end here. And then it finds this little pore and it passes into this cell and it hits another dead end and it fills this cell up and then it finds a pore. And you can see it kind of meanders its way up, up the plant, okay. Uh, this is considered to be a more primitive way to move the water. Compare that to vessels, which are literally like soda straws stuck together like this. And now the ends are perforated and the water can just move straight up like this. One of the things that we do when we compare trachea, when we look at a plant, and we see the percentage of tracheids to vessels. When we see lots of tracheids compared to vessels, we say, well, that's a more primitive plant in terms of evolution. When we see more vessels, we say that's a more advanced plant in terms of evolution. And so we see both of these tissues mixed together in all vascular plants, all plants that have this kind of tissue. But, um, you know, depending on the ratio of tracheids to vessels, we might say, oh, well, that plant's more primitive or that plant's more advanced, okay? So that's the scoop on those. And you can see this here, uh, there's the tracheid uh, and here are some vessels, okay? The last slide that we'll look at today has to do with phloem. I think I'll take a screenshot of, uh -oh. I'll take a screenshot of this and just draw right on it. So you have two different kinds of cells here. You have what's called a sieve cell. And you can see it's very similar to a vessel. Its end walls are are perforated, you know, and so the water or the sugar water can pass through like this. And again, it's a two-way street. The interesting thing about a sieve cell, or they're calling it a sieve tube member, same thing. They are living, but they are enucleate. Enucleate means no nucleus. 
Now, if you recall, the nucleus is kind of like the brain or the command center of a cell. And what it does is it uh, protects the cell from, um, I'm sorry, it, it um, controls things like metabolism and, uh, you know, protein synthesis and all these other things. Well, these cells' sole function is to move the sugar water around, so they don't have a nucleus, but they have a companion cell, and the companion cell has a nucleus. And you can see here that uh, for each sieve cell, there is, in fact, a companion cell. And they're even connected right here through these little strands of cytoplasm called plasma desmata. You don't really have to know that word. But the companion cell controls the metabolism of the sieve cell so that the sieve cell can function to move this sugar water up and down the cell. Okay? So together, the xylem and the phloem is referred to as vascular, I'm not writing very well, vascular tissue. Xylem and phloem is vascular tissue. Vascular, think like the veins of the plant. Okay. Um, I think we're going to stop there. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the little presentation. Uh, I will um, have another video for you soon, I hope. And hope you have a great day. Thanks a lot. I will talk to you next time. Bye bye. Bye.